Hello, I'm Tim Rogers, professional video game expert. You are watching Kotaku.com. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee are out today for the Nintendo Switch game console. I keep trying to get people to call it the Swintendo. I wish somebody would. The Pokemon Let's Go series is both a remake of Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, the Pokemon games that started the whole series, and a generous effort by Nintendo to invite all the fanatical players of the long popular Pokemon Go mobile phone app over to enjoy some of the classic insidious game design that tricked all those 90s kids into memorizing the names of these little creatures in the first place. On the one hand, Pokemon Let's Go is innocent, accessible fun for both your little brother and your grandma. On the other hand, deep beneath its fuzzy meat is an iron-hard skeleton of ancient game design bones, hungry to crush and frustrate you. To frustrate you, this is where we come in. Kotaku.com's resident Pokemon master, Gita Jackson, has sent me along a few handy tips, which I've turned into a video. Wow. So join me and my two very large friends while we spill you some precious details. Pikachu or Eevee? Pokemon Let's Go's first true challenge starts at GameStop, Amazon.com, Best Buy, Walmart, Target, wherever you buy your video games. Certainly not Toys R Us. The challenge is a big one. Will you choose Pikachu or Eevee? They're both adorable, and they both have their share of fans, though in my mathematical opinion, neither Pikachu nor Eevee is especially better. Pokemon Let's Go's starter Pikachu and starter Eevee both differ greatly from their wild variants. Unlike their wild cousins, they will both refuse to evolve, thus locking their adventurous spirits in baby child buddy friend state forever. They will also learn a vastly different set of techniques compared to their common scrub variants. What you're really choosing when you choose Pikachu or Eevee is which one of these little buddies would you rather see in cutscenes? Upon which of them would you rather place hats or drape outfits? Which of them would you most enjoy petting in a simple simplistic, beautiful, stress-free, quote-unquote, minigame. Sure, some of the wild Pokémon's locations differ between versions, though for the most part you're choosing which one of these cuddly little creatures you would like to make your digital little buddy. If you have no opinion either way, the decision might be trickier. If you're a cat or a dog person, choose Eevee. If you prefer hamsters or Hello Kitty, check out Pikachu. If your favorite color is brown, go for Eevee. If you frequently fantasize about being struck by lightning, check out Pikachu. Or try this simple mnemonic device. Is your name Stevie? You're getting an Eevee. Were you born in June? Sounds like you're Pikachu. Never buy Pokeballs. Unlike older Pokemon games, in Pokemon Let's Go you no longer battle wild Pokemon in tall grass. In an obvious effort to synchronize its sensibilities with Pokemon Go's variety of Pokekleptomania, in Pokemon Let's Go you catch everything that breathes. You earn experience and level up your Pokemon simply by catching other Pokemon. It's like they love to see their friends stuffed into tight places. You start the game with literally 50 Pokeballs in your inventory. In the original Pokemon Red, you started with zero. This drastic shift in the experience requires the game to be always giving you Pokeballs. Every time you beat a random trainer in a Pokemon battle, you always receive Pokeballs. You find them lying on the ground all over the place. Townspeople are always telling you to get some, or talking about buying them themselves. Sometimes random people just hand Pokeballs to you. Of course, just like in the older games, you can still pay hard money for them at the Pokemarts in town. They cost way too much. To me, their presence as items you can buy at the store feels like a formality more than anything else. It's a throwback to the way things were. Don't waste your money. You will have hundreds of Pokeballs before you can possibly finish this game. You can skip cutscenes? Perhaps you care less for the cartoon depiction of a youth coming of age than you do for the bloodthirsty business of catching them all. It may thus delight you to know that you can skip the cutscenes. It's a little option in the menu. Just open your main menu, press whichever button it tells you to press to open the options menu, that's Y, and then choose Skip Cutscenes. This will make it so that you can press the plus button during cutscenes to skip through them. They bury this option because they don't want people feeling sad about accidentally skipping cutscenes. Though if you ask me, they could have implemented one of those hold the button down and watch a progress bar fill in features. Oh, yeah, and if you care more for winning than you do for bonding with your cutely animated digital buddy friend, you can turn off your Pokemon's battle animations. Handheld mode makes catching easier. If you play Pokemon Let's Go in TV mode, the game requires you to play using just one Joy-Con. 
This gets awkward. Moving your thumb from the analog stick to the buttons always feels weird. Furthermore, to catch a Pokemon in TV mode, you have to use motion controls. Gita Jackson and I both agree that catching Pokemon is much easier in portable mode. You just hold the switch up and move it gently to aim, periscope style, and then press a button to throw. It kinda feels like Pokemon Snap. So while I personally prefer to play on my large television, if there's a Pokemon I'm having trouble catching, I go portable. I just want to say, though, for the record, I actually like the motion control. Then again, I loved Frisbee Golf and Wii Sports Resort. I loved it so much. Partner up! At some point early in the game, you will be offered the opportunity to choose one of your Pokémon to be a partner. You're going to want to do this as soon as you are able. Your partner Pokémon will scamper and scurry along in front of you. Sometimes it feels like you're controlling them and the trainer is following. The partner Pokémon will occasionally stop, emote an exclamation point, and report the finding of an item. Either that, or they're just distracted by some pretty scenery. You can avoid trainer battles. Yes, in Pokemon Let's Go, you do not battle wild Pokemon. You only catch them. However, don't worry, battle mavens. Once you graduate from tutorial kindergarten, you're gonna do plenty of battling. You'll do so much battling, you might get sick of it. Well, then you're in luck. You can avoid most of the trainers in the field most of the time. Just try to stay out of their direct line of sight. Notice how a lot of them stand in place rotating. It's like a stealth game for babies. Just remember to come back when you're truly ready to rip and tear these stupid kids as weak pets to shreds. Use lures! You can buy repels and lures in Pokemarts in towns. Repels will keep Pokemon away, though this ain't Pokemon Red on your dad's Game Boy, so why would you want to keep Pokemon away? As I've said, you're gonna have hundreds of Pokeballs. Some Pokemon are rarer than others, so sometimes you're gonna be creeping around in the local tall grass, and the one Pokemon you want to grind just ain't gonna be showing up. If you're surrounded by insignificant trash Pokemon, slam down a lure and let the big weird ones come tumbling out of the woodwork. Candy? From beasts? As the story progresses, your Pokemon trainer avatar's little backpack will verge upon bursting full of Pokeballs, full of Pokemon. Seeing as you can only use six Pokemon in your battle party at a time, and only those six in your battle party level up as you catch Pokemon, you'll face a real likelihood that necessity will determine you to develop favorites. Thus it behooves you to unload your unnecessaries. For profit, you will own hundreds upon hundreds of Pokemon one metaphorical prison and four physical prisons deep, within balls, within a box, within your bag, beneath your will. Professor Oak wants all of them. Send the diabolical professor your superfluous captive animals. By some arcane, eldritch, horrible, Lovecraftian, Frankenstein basement procedure, Professor Oak will boil down the hairy skin, sinewy meat, chalky bones, greasy marrow, and gelatinous viscera of your unwanted beasts until only candy remains. Feed this Poke product to your hungry surviving companions and receive instant permanent status upgrades. Send a lot of the same species of Pokemon to the Sinister Professor to receive even better candies. Use the favorite system. You can specify a Pokemon as a favorite in the menu. Specifying a Pokemon as a favorite will prohibit its submission to the butcher pile, protecting it from accidental inclusion in a meat delivery to Professor Oak. Your favorite Pokemon thus exist untouchable to the candy cleaver. In other words, favorite your Pokemon so you don't accidentally turn them into candy. Always be eating candy. In the old days, you'd fight Pokemon, catch Pokemon, level up your favorites, and continue your righteous journey toward conquest of all the gym leaders with your favorite Pokemon at your side. Now the loop has transformed. Catch Pokemon, turn Pokemon into candy, level up your favorite Pokemon, and continue stabbing forward. Back in the old days, candies were special rare treats for Pokemon. If you played the old games, therefore, you might be hesitant to eat your candies right away. Well, now now candies are just part of the loop. I know what you're thinking. If you fed a cat or a dog some candy, it would die. So this settles the age-old debate once and for all. Pokemon are not pets. They're little buddies. They're pretty much people. Stock up for the Elite Four. When the fateful day arrives for you to truly ascend to the rank of Pokemon Master, realize that when you fight the Elite Four, you have to beat them all in one go. Buy a bursting, bonker-loaded burger bucket of spray potions and little buddy treats to keep your game-designed anime animals unhungry and wide-eyed for the duration of their final grueling contest. Seriously, with other gyms, you can walk in, fight one trainer, and then walk out. You can't do that with the Elite Four. That's why they're elite. If you ask me, it's kind of narratively unfair. Why do I have to fight four people to prove that I'm as strong as one of them? Also, remember to save right before you go in. Don't buy this thing, unless you really, really want it. This Pokeball controller is $50. That's $10 more than a single Joy-Con. 
You can put a Pokemon in it and press the button to hear the Pokemon make a sound, though you seriously don't need it. The ergonomics of it are pretty awkward. The motion controls for throwing a Pokeball in TV mode seem distinctly tuned to match the movement of a single Joy-Con. In other words, not this thing. I don't know about you, though I can't flick my wrist while gripping a little sphere without deeply needing to throw it all the way across the room and bounce it off a wall. Performing a dainty little wrist flick with this cheap piece of rubber in my hand only teases my bounce hunger. I don't need it. You can rename your Pokemon whenever you want. In Pokemon Red and Blue, you had to meet some guy in some house like halfway through the game if you wanted to change your Pokemon's names. Unlike previous games, when you catch a Pokemon, the game doesn't immediately ask you if you want to give it a name, probably because you're literally catching hundreds of Pokemon. Having to name them after every battle would get really slow. So instead, you name your Pokemon from the god darn menu. It's right there. I named two Pidgeys Bird and Flapson. I named two Oddishes Clump and Claude. I named a Spearow Mr. Feathers. I named a Zubat Batman. I named an Onyx Solid Snake. You can name your Pokemon any stupid name you want and then change it two minutes later without repercussions, even in the middle of a dungeon. The types don't make any sense. If you want to really blast through Pokemon Let's Go's main campaign, it'll help to have a thorough knowledge of the types. Electricity defeats water. Fire burns grass. Fire melts ice. Flying does double damage against bugs, because early birds get the worm. Rock does double damage against flying, because you can kill two birds with one stone. Water type does double damage against ground type, because water turns dirt into mud, I guess. Water type does double damage against rock type as well, because, uh, oceans erode mountains over periods of millions of years. Grass type also does double damage against rock type, because anytime anybody sees a picture of Mount Everest, they imagine slicing it in half like hot butter with a fern frond. Ghosts do double damage against ghosts. You'd think ghosts wouldn't be afraid of ghosts. Wind type Pokemon beats grass type Pokemon. I suppose wind is responsible for a majority of leaves falling off trees in autumn. However, given the pervasiveness within the collective subconscious of golden wheat fields flowing while the wind is a-blowing, one should by logic not risk the ridicule of one's Pokemon training peers, should they presume that wind and grass were the best of friends, offering no damage bonuses one way or the other. Electric Pokemon do double damage against flying Pokemon because, you know, you have to imagine that every time you see a lightning bolt, at least six birds got punctured by it. Ice also does double damage against flying. I really don't know why. Birds are very resilient in, in cold weather. Birds don't fly south for the winter because they're cold. Birds fly south for the winter because their food is dead. Look, I'm not sure why a lot of these rules are, in fact, the rules. If you've never played a Pokemon game before, maybe just Google Pokemon type chart. Print it out in color on your office's printer. Get to the printer before anyone else sees it. Lie that it's something your gastroenterologist sent you to help you manage your Crohn's disease if a co-worker gets to the printer first. Fold it up and put it into your pocket. Six-year-olds have no problem memorizing the Pokemon types. However, if you're any kind of fully grown adult with any sort of common sense at all, based on any life experience at all, you face a real danger of goofing up a decisive battle. You will never catch them all. Despite the Pokemon multimedia franchise's incessant repetition of the fetching phrase, gotta catch them all, players hoping to actually catch, quote unquote, them all, might suffer crushing disappointment. While the possibility exists to catch one of each, or even two of each, if you want to consider the legend of Noah's Ark, the feat of catching every one of all of them requires more than Herculean willpower and the absolute lack of job or life obligations. Should you possess infinite longevity, your grandchildren's grandchildren's great-grandchildren's bones will have become dust before you can catch mm, all. For every Pokemon you successfully catch, the game can and will spawn replacements in vicious infinitude. Try as you might, if you see a Pokemon in the wild, you cannot drive its species to extinction. So it goes. The game of Pokemon, like that of life, does not end. Well, that's enough out of me for today. I'm gonna get cracking on catching more of these pocketable monstrosities. Until next time, I was born stupid. However, I will not die hungry. Video games forever. Kotaku.com It's me!